Good afternoon again, everybody. Um, this is Jen Micklick. I am your host for this 30 minute Game Seeker Tech Tips Live. And I have with me Byron Shetler, our so called Apple geek, um, who is excited to show us what it takes moving from templates to inspections. I want to briefly mention on this one, this is such a um, fact-filled topic, right, Byron, mm -hmm. that we may end up, instead of doing the 15 minutes um, that Byron shows and then 15 minutes for Q&A, it's probably going to be more like 20 minutes of Byron showing us and giving us great direction and tips and 10 minutes for Q&A. Again, just a reminder, any questions, especially on this topic, uh, if we don't get to you, we will definitely respond to them offline as soon as we can. We're also recording this. We'll be available usually within a day or two as well. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I am going to pass the baton over to Byron. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. All right. And it is on its way, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So let's start off with uh, converting a template from the tour database. So in the SPC designer, uh, I chose this template. Uh, let's see here. Basic keyboard, one feature plus a photo. So just jumping into the template itself, we'll make a quick run through of this um, just so you have an idea of what the template's trying to accomplish. Now it has two rows. But the second row isn't used for data collection, it is used to show a part photo. And this is a common template programming trick, using an extra row to do extra work. So it starts off with a calculated cell, and in it there's some documentation notes just at the top. And it also sets the tabs with the set tab command, the real-time colors and links web pages. And then towards the bottom, it sets a part photo, and it does a little HTML wrapper around that uh, JPEG file so we can display it on the screen. And moving right along, cell B enters the part number of the standard, and it's got that current command, which is a little trick, again, to use in a template to either take what the operator input or if it's coming from a planned session to use that planned session value. Cell C has a formula to set the operator name based on the GameSeeker login name. The next cell, lot number is just a basic keyboard input. The department uh, displays a message up on the screen for the operator to see, and then it just has a department hard-coded. It gets a little interesting in the shift uh, column where the shift is set automatically with a bunch of if-then statements, and it looks like the shift you know, the shifts go from 8 to 4, 4 to midnight, and then shift 3 is from midnight to 8 a.m. There's some logic there behind that. And then the machine does keyboard input, and it also clears out the message that the operator sees up on the screen. Cells H through O are just doing data input up to a subgroup size of 8 in this case. And then this last column, uh, if the data is okay, so it pops up a data okay message, then it saves the data, and then it goes back to cell H1. If the operator says, no, the data is not okay, it still goes back to cell H1 and goes through the template again and lets the operator re-enter the data if needed. So if we go on ahead to, this is step five, which automatically pops up when you're um, editing a template. If we go to step six, if I can click on it, there we go. In step six, you can see that there are a number of tabs, traceability, data table, statistics, the real-time colors, and links tabs. The file names are blank, but we're building those on the fly in cell A1. You know, you might base it on a part number or something else as you're going through that. So that is uh, what we have for the template. And if we go ahead and run it, we'll use our power tools, go to data entry, We hope. There it comes. 
load up our template. And you can see there's a message on the screen. I can pick my part number. I'll do a search. I think I want a length. You can see a little picture off on the right. Control chart. Now it's asking me for my lot. That's not made up at all. And machine. And if I go back and look at the traceability tab, you can see the information that was entered, some statistics for that part number, and here's our web page with real-time color failures and some links if the operator needs more information. So at this point, I can enter my data, one, two, and three. Here's my data, okay, yes, no. I can say yes and save it, or no and go back and re-enter my data. And you kind of get the idea. A lot of you have seen this before with the templates. So now what will it create, to, what will it take to create an inspection to duplicate this functionality? All right, so let's load up the inspection editor and we'll do a new inspection. And just a quick reminder, in case you guys are not on the full screen, you do have that capability to blow the screen up if it's a little small for you. So on the upper right-hand side. Sorry, go ahead. All right. And this is SPC only. We're not going to do any defect data with this particular one. And we'll call this sub-inspection traceability and data. Uh, and here we go with a blank screen. So. The first thing we want to do is remember back to the template. We had operator and shift, which were traceability fields, which were automatically calculated. And then we had lot number and machine number, which were inputs. We also have what's called a numeric input on the inspection side, which will allow the operator to pick the standard, which eliminates that part number column, and input the data. So we had 16 cells in the template, and that's reduced to five items in the inspection. And generally that seems to be true as you're going through and uh, entering the inspection. It, it seems, from my experience, it's, it's a lot simplified from the template side. Now we will have an extra item with Python script, so I guess it goes from 16 down to six items if you want to think of it that way. So we could store the operator and the shift behind the scenes to further simplify the inspection. But in this case, let's uh, go ahead and display those values. So we're going to pick operator, and we'll pick uh, another traceability item, which is shift, just so we can see them on the screen rather than setting them and, and hiding them. And for the operator, uh, there's a couple properties here that I'm interested in required and restricted, same thing for shift. Now, since we're setting these automatically, it doesn't really matter if I set these or not because the script's gonna set them. Uh, but where we really care about the required and restricted is with the um, lot and the machine. And in case you're wondering what entry required or entry restricted, there's always some little uh, help down on the, in the, is that yellow? <laughs> the yellow box down yes. there? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, and then entry restricted, it kind of explains what's going on with each one. So for machine, let's go ahead and set entry required to true. I don't know if you caught that there, but I, I was double clicking on the value, which is for me simpler than going over and trying to do target practice on these arrows and then picking the value. So you can double click to cycle through all the values. So if you've got a drop down list of five values, you can keep double clicking until you get to the one you want or drop down the list. So we set um, machine, you can see there also those entries are bold. So Basically, anything that's bold in the property window means that I changed it. So that's an e easy visual clue for you to see, okay, I changed required and restricted on machine to true. And for the lot, I'll set entry required 
to true. Now, I'm not going to set restricted to true because it's not come from a list because these lot numbers maybe it's just be random numbers coming in. And you don't really know what they are ahead of time. But we do want the operator to enter it. We don't want them to be able to save the data without uh, not specifying it. All right. So I think that's it for our traceability. So now let's go ahead and do a numeric input. So when I click on that, uh, this is going to be a length input. So I'll just type a label of length in there. And this SPC standard selection is defaults to pick ahead of time. And I really want the operator to pick this at runtime in this particular example. Now I could specify the standard ahead of time, but instead I'm going to go down to the SPC standard search string. And here I'm going to type in length. And that shows me what uh, standards are available. And that way, when the operator clicks the button to pick their standard, it's already filtered down the length. They don't have to go through the extra work of, of uh, filtering that list down. And again, you can see that's bold. The values that have changed are bold, which is a nice visual clue as to what you've changed from the default. So finally, I need a Python script to tie everything together. If I wasn't auto-setting the operator and the shift, I wouldn't need the script. But since we're doing that, we're going to need a script. And that's true, you know, both for templates and inspections. And in general, you don't need to write extra code, but often it's a nice uh, enhancement to the user interface. A little bit of time spent up front can pay big dividends long term in that you make life simpler for the operators uh, by spending a little bit of time up front. And that helps with operator acceptance and just if you add up all that cumulative time spent entering data, if you can cut seconds off the operator time, that, that adds up over time. All right, so the last thing then we need is a uh, Python script. So I'll click this formula button here and click on Python script. And we go to the script editor, and I'll click New. And uh, I think we'll say Name and Shift is what we'll call this one, because we're going to set the operator name and the shift automatically. So to cut time a little bit here, I have a few items that I'll just paste in. So I try to put a comment at the top of the script. That pound sign means the rest of the comment. We're going to set the operator name to the Windows login name and set the shift based on the computer clock is what this script is trying to do. So I can save it at this point and select it. Now, there's still some work to be done, but you can see it set the formula and set the Python script. Now, a nice shortcut that I like is once I've specified that script, if I just go and double click on the formula, it takes me straight into editing the script so I don't have to play target track practice and go click on that little button up in the corner there. I tried to make that button bigger, but Microsoft won't let me. So go figure. <laughs> All right. Okay, so back on this screen, you see these numbers off to the left. Those are test IDs. Um, they're not, I mean, they're okay, but in, in my case, they're not real useful because I'd like to use this script in the future. You know, the lazy Lazy, best programmers are lazy programmers, and they like to reuse things. So I'm going to reuse this script in the future. So I'm going to name some of these items, change their test IDs, which are just kind of random numbers, um, to actually something that's useful. So I can use the script with future inspections where I may not have the same test ID, the numbers, uh, for these traceability fields. But by giving them useful names, I'll be able to use or reuse the script. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is set the uh, traceability field called operator. And you can see how this list pops up. It's nice to help uh, in the Python editor. It helps me to know what to use. So here's value, and I want to set that to uh, a login. Now, I can't remember, is it computer user? That's the name of the Windows user. 
Our username is a game ticker user. I, I really want whoever's logged in on the computer at this point. So I'm going to say computer user. And that's it. That'll set the operator when I come into the system. So one thing I forgot to mention back here, this is a pre-script. It runs before the inspection load. There's post. You can actually make a button that the user can click on with a click, and there's an on change and, and other things. But this is a pre-script that runs ahead of time. All right, so how did I know this to do like login dot? I mean, how, how did I know to get that login object? Well, uh, there's a magical file out there in the uh, GameSeeker slash PyLive folder where all the Python uh, scripts are called template python guide.txt. And this is a file we've generated to help you if you know a template command but you don't know how to do the same thing in Python, this file will tell you how to do that. So if I type in name and go down here, we can see the login username. Oh, and there's network name, login.computer user, which is what I wanted to do in the first place. So this was a great file to keep open and to use when, if you know what a template command is, but you're not sure how to do it in Python. I used this for many years. All right. I think I still use it. <laughs> so back here, we want to set the uh, shift value as well. And we'll set it to shift calc. That sounds like a great variable. Hey, and we're done, right? Well, it may not be quite that easy. We have to actually set the shift calc value. Now, and how are we going to do that? Well, let's go back to our file. And if we search, maybe like for now, all right, there's a now function, HSI date dot display date time. Well, that, I think that's a string. If we go down to display date time, yeah, that's a string. We really want a date object, so that's not going to do us a whole lot of good. If we go back to our help file and search this time on... Oh, what? Date time. Because we want a date time object. Here we find date diff, and there's a bunch of code here about importing date time and doing a dot now. And oh, I guess we can get the hour eventually. But I happen to notice when I pop down this HSI date, it already has an hour property. So why write new code when we can use some existing stuff? So let's go ahead and use the hour property. And we'll set. Um, an hour variable equal to that. And once again, I think I have a little bit of code I'll swipe just to save some time. So what we have here is some code that we were running in the template. Uh, it says that the hour is greater than or equal to eight, it's first shift, it's four after, it's second shift, and Finally, it's third shift. Now, hopefully some of you are jumping out of your chairs at this point and saying, hey, there's a problem with that logic. Like, if it's 4 o'clock, 1600, it's going to hit that greater than 8 and do first shift. So we don't really want it this way. In the template, it was okay to do that because each if then was on its own separate line. But here I'm using an if, else, if, else. And so I really have to be careful that I don't uh, have a logic issue when converting over from a template to the to the inspection. So let's do if it if it's greater than 1600, we'll set it to shift two. If it wasn't greater than 1600, it may be greater than equal to eight, which is shift one. Otherwise, it's shift three, which is from zero to seven in the morning. So where are we at? So we've got that done. Um, for you know, for advanced programmers, there may be different constructs you might want to use, but I'm trying to keep this simple with the with the if then. 
So we could, at this point, we could save our code and step through it. You can either use the F8 key or the step button. And, oh, I can't see my inspection. Oh, because I was running on two screens earlier and it's off <laughs> on, a, on a different screen. Great. All right. Can you see it on your? I, I'm still seeing your inspection. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. I have to figure that out. Um, so if we save and publish, publish it to PC. Let's try to run it from here. And once again, it's on the other screen. Oh, this is terrible. All Can right. Can we do that move? The window? Yeah, the I tried doing that, the alt space M to move it. Oh, there it is. It worked that time. It just needed me yeah. to force it through. All right, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it was on my second monitor, which I just unplugged for the purpose of this. So here's our traceability and data. We can click on it. Um, looks like I can actually type in my operator shift, so we'll want to clean that up. You can pick a lot. We can do our machine, pick a part number. There are the lengths already picked. So I can do this. One, two, you know, just like before. And there we go. There's our data input. So I don't like the fact that it's the operator and shift is not disabled. It's letting me enter those. So we can go back. And I just happen to have that code here. So we can paste that in. So we're going to disable those two items, even though they're there. All right. Well, it looks like we're about running out of time here. I was going to actually make some edits to this and show you um, how you can compare shifts over time. And maybe I'll, I'll just do that really quick. So let's say we uh, want to make a copy of this script. I try to use uh, like a backup copy name, 2807.19. So there we made a backup copy. Now we'll go back to our original script and maybe add a comment in like um, shift 2 starts at 4 p.m., something to that effect, and save that. Now one, one cool feature with scripts if you want to compare those two, there's a little uh, WinMerge app you can download and it'll show you, you can step through your scripts and see what all has changed, what's changed from one version to the next. And that, that function exists in templates, although it's not as slick as, as what this is here. So the other thing I want to do, I don't want the, lot, the uh, lot number to be remembered from time to time. So I'm just going to set the value of that to be empty. So it doesn't remember, it doesn't pop it up each time like it'll remember the machine and that sort of thing. So I'll set the value to blank. So if we, if we do run it again, and you know, another thing you can do is set breakpoints. So I can set a breakpoint at this first place, and when it comes in, it hits the breakpoint, stops. You can step through the code. There you can see the hour is 14 because it's 2 o'clock over here in the variable window. And I can step through. You can see variables being set, that sort of thing. Hit continue. Now we can see these values are disabled. Lots blank coming in, where once you get going on this data input, it would remember that and prep it with the previous value. So that's taken care of. All right. So what are we missing? We're missing the tabs. And we're about out of time. Can I go ahead and do the tabs, or do you want to 
do some questions now, Jen. Go ahead and do the TAMs. Um, I know that we do have a, a great general question. Okay. Um, and I know I'm also going to be sending everybody some information about Python and so a little more stuff, but go ahead, Byron. All right. You go. <laughs> Sorry, when I timed myself earlier, it only took me 20 minutes. I guess I got a little verbose here. Well, you didn't time it with me. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's it. Everybody, you can blame it on me. <laughs> All right, so we want to set up tabs yet as well. So at the sub-inspection level, we already have the traceability, so we don't need an extra tab for that. There's a chart options SPC button here. We'll just quickly do this. So. We'll say we want to use the numeric input standard. Whatever the user picks for the standard, we're going to use that. We're not going to pick any other standards ahead of time. We want a control chart, a stats list, and a data table. And on step three, I think the template was showing 35 data points, so we'll say show 35 data points. Cool, and we're done. Uh, we could clear the side panel every time we come in. This is going to show up on the side, but I'm not going to do that. But we still need to load the two uh, web pages, the real-time colors and the links. And these are pretty simple uh, script commands. So at the inspect level, there's a side panel object, and we can add a web page. Uh, we'll call it real-time colors. And the URL, I know there's a file object. And it uses this get path one, which is a data command, color key.html. I think if we looked at the step six of the um, template editor, we would have seen. All right. And then the other one was um, links, I believe, was the name of it. And for some reason, it didn't have an L on the end of it. And we'll call it links. OK. The other thing we want to do is add that uh, image, that JPEG of the file. In this case, we don't have to, um, we don't have to put an HTML wrapper around the JPEG file. We can just access it automatically. And there's also a way to add a picture without doing Python as well, right? Oh yeah, you can. There's some properties. Uh, I forgot for, about for, that. For those yeah. of us that don't like the Python, everything mm -hmm. I'm talking to you guys because it's me. There are other ways of adding HTML, right. PDF, yeah, and I images. forgot all about that. So that's all right. I got you back. Thanks. <laughs> I'm just so used to putting the code in. Byron there. makes coding look easy, but I understand. <laughs> so, no worries on that. Uh, let's see here. I want, actually, I wanted side panel. I'm not sure where I was going with this. Side panel, and I want to bring that item to the front. So, I want that to be the first thing the operator sees. Okay. So, I think that's it. If we run it, Go in, and there, that's the first thing the operator sees. Once I pick my part number, I should get a data table and a... Um, and you do have your two. Line. Yeah, there's my control chart, my stats list, my data table, my links, and my real-time colors. Well, it's pretty much everything that was in the template. And if you're scared of uh, the uh, Python, there's also a library button here where you can download some sample Python uh, scripts just to kind of see how we did certain things. Um, I want to be All conscious right. of everybody's time. I am willing to stay a couple minutes over. We are recording this, so if you have to go, um, make sure you come back to the recording. We did get a great question, and Byron, thank you. You're welcome. You always make this stuff look easy, and it is easy. It, it really is. It is. Um, got a great question. Inspections look neat, right? Yay. Yay. Good job, Byron. 
Um, what advantages, disadvantages do they have over templates and the planned sessions? Are there scenarios where inspections actually work better than templates? Uh, yeah, I mean, it partly depends on what you're doing, but there's there's scenarios where, and there's planned inspections as well. So you can yeah. feed in an inspection with information just like you feed a template uh, with information through a plan session. I mean, some of the, let's say the OPC programming or maybe some of your file interfaces, I think are a lot easier in the Python than the, than the code in a template. And as far as speed? Speed, uh, Typically, an inspection, like if you're doing high volume data input, is about 20 times faster, stores the data about 20 times faster than a template would wow. when you're reading file, that sort of thing. Okay. So it, it executes a lot faster and it can store data a lot faster because it's using a new generation of technology. Awesome. And, and nowadays, there's nothing that you can do in a template that you can't do in inspections, right? We're, we've, that's been a, a design goal and focus for the last number of releases is trying to make inspections um, fully functional in terms of they can do everything that a template can do. Awesome. That's that's our goal. So there might be a gap here or there, but I mean it's 99.9% .9 of the way there. Good, that's so. a little epic. And one more question. Um, can Hersler help me get started on converting my templates? Well, I think you know the, the answer to that as, as well as I do. Sure, we can. Um, you know, maybe with like an inspection training, one of the deliverables would be uh, take a template and convert that into an inspection as part of the inspection class. Right. So when we do inspections, especially if we know you're going to do that, we provide some coaching time. Right. And that is something that we can scale. So if we need more than a half a day or a day, we can definitely do that. So awesome. Great. Um, again, thank you, everybody. If you have last-minute questions, even as we're getting ready to sign off, please go ahead and ask them. We will get back with you offline. Um, this should be up viewable, I want to say, probably around Monday. Um, we have some Python resources that I'll be sending out to everybody that Byron went through. So if you said, where, where is that text file located, we're going to give you the answer to all that. Um, so if there's there's nothing else, well, three minutes late. That's you know on a topic like this, that that's not bad. Nope. So again, thank you everybody. Certainly appreciate it. If you guys have any idea for future Tech Tip Lives that you'd like to see us do, you you know we listen we listen to your questions and your enhancement requests. So just let us know. All right, I think we're going to be signing off. Have a great day, everybody.